<clears throat> All right, it's Thursday, October 25th, 2018. This is Layla Voral interviewing Virginia Morawick in her apartment in the village for the second time to fill in the gaps that we lost with our first interview with our technology glitch. So thank you very much. Well, welcome back. <laughs> the Stonewall Oral History Project and I personally are really grateful that you're willing to do this. Um, so one of the things that we uh, talked about after the first interview was um, the fact that many women used only their first name or pseudonyms when you, in your early life. Can you tell me about that? That's right. Um, it was interesting. I had the good fortune of working with gay people from the very first when I got to um, New York City from the University of Cincinnati where I went to school. So I had a level of comfort um, at that point. But when you went out to, it was mostly bars at that time where you would, would meet other people, bars or um, the Village Voice. Um, many times you would meet people and you would get their name, but um, it wouldn't be their real name. So that was interested, interesting because you never really knew who exactly you were dealing with. And even, um, I have to say, my first long-term partner who I met um, at, the, at a meeting of the Daughters of Belitis, I did not actually know her name for, a real name for about a year and a half. And it wasn't until I moved in with her, and it wasn't her name on the mailbox. It was someone else's. And <laughs> I, I realized, and she explained, that she had to protect herself. She was teaching at Columbia University in the School of Social Work, and uh, she had to protect herself, whether it was um, a professional or um, family thing, she did not go by her real name uh, out in the gay world. And, and what year was that, that you moved in together? Um, 1969. And so for a year and a half, you called her by one name, and then one, did, did, were you able to switch and then call her by her real name, or did she? I, um, I, well, we had other nicknames, like uh, I called her Cookie and she called me Toots. <laughs> you know, that was pretty much it. But a funny story was actually her parents uh, and my parents got, we brought them together at one point. And of course, my parents knew her by her gay name, not her real name. And her parents thought my parents were crazy and they didn't know who my parents were talking about when it was their daughter. And that was a whole, and trying to explain to my parents, don't call her by this name, call her by the other name. It's like, oh, it was chaos. It was, it was chaos. That's <laughs> Thank right. goodness this doesn't happen these days. And did you use a different name? No, I didn't. And do you remember why you, why you didn't? I didn't know that people did that because other gay people that I had met in Cincinnati where I was going to school, we for the most part knew each other through something, class or one thing or another. So obviously our name was our name. So, so you didn't have anybody kind of initiating you into the life and saying, here's how we do things or? Not really, not really. And did you have a way of recognizing sort of who other lesbians were? Were there? Some? Well, the gaydar thing. But you know, in, well, even today, I think, um, if it's not always comfortable to reach out to someone, um, I think even more so with women than men. Um, but uh, gaydar definitely helps so that you can make some inroads just in a general way <laughs> to find out if someone is gay or not. Okay. One woman told me that she said people would say, 
come saying like, oh, are you in the life? And that if a woman said yes, then you went, then you knew that she knew that you were asking, are you a lesbian? If your gaydar, if you mm -hmm. were sure about your gaydar. Well, I was hoping people would know I was gay because I was running around since, I guess, 1967 with a motorcycle. And I was hoping, this was somewhat unusual back then. And then I drove my little Honda 90 out to college my sophomore year. And I was the only one, actually I was the only girl in my school that um, in my, you know, design, art, and architecture um, that had a motorcycle. And I would thought that would have thought that was a big, um, a big clue that I might be gay. And uh, also in New York, I remember one time, not many people have heard of this bar, but it was called Cookies. And it was on 14th Street. I think it was between um, 6th and 7th. And, um, and it was definitely a, a mafia bar, and um, Cookie was this hot bleached blonde, you know. <laughs> she, I don't even know whether she was gay or not, but anyway, it was a kind of a happening place, and I remember one time going in there, and the bouncer told me to check my helmet. And I didn't want to check my helmet because I wanted the women to see that I had my helmet to know that I have a bike and, you know, that I, you know, might be interesting. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it was funny. I just love that. I love the thought of you thinking that your motorcycle would tell people something that, and it didn't seem to tell them. Well, it didn't, or it didn't do me any good, or uh, who knows. <laughs> Not that kind of a gal. I love that. So, so this is a big switching of gears, but I wanted to ask you about Edie Windsor. I know she was one of your closest and dearest friends. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how you met and became friends? Well, we, um, we met, I think our first contact was um, when Chris Almvig, who was one of the founders of SAGE, when she um, was starting a new group called Matrix, a home of our own. And it was um, a fundraising group trying to raise enough money that we could possibly buy a building uh, in New York that could be a retirement place for lesbians to go to. And um, <clears throat> so I met Edie there, and it was at the very beginnings of the organization and Edie and I were on the same committee to interview uh, possible board members for the, for the group. So that's how we first met. And it was very, we, we interviewed some wonderful people and were very excited about it. Um, so that's how we first met. And then <clears throat> eventually I met Thea and um, because I would run into them at the center on 13th Street, which was a thriving, happening place back in the 80s, too. It was a little bit run down, not what it looks like today, but it was um, salt of the earth, the center of our community. So when was it that you met, Edie? When was Matrix starting? I think it was in the early 80s. So you were long before retirement age at that point. Like, do you remember what, like, why that was an organization that you got involved oh, in? Oh, um, well, I was looking to become involved in the community. Um, and I think at that point, it was just at that point, I wasn't living in New York anymore. I was living in New Jersey, and but I was working in New York. So I wanted to, my social life seemed to be in New York, and I had friends I stayed with all the time in New York, so I really felt my heart was in the city. And so it was a way to, um, it was a way to meet people, create a social life, and have long time friends, and, <clears throat> and all that, and, and also being involved in a worthwhile cause. And what happened to Matrix? Um, I 
think it went on for a couple of years, but then it kind of fell apart. And it fell apart, I think, because um, Chris, who was such a strong leader, um, left the city. I, I think she broke up with her partner and left the city. And um, it just it wasn't strong enough to continue on its own. Um, gee, I don't actually remember, but we, well, we did bond while we were interviewing these people because everybody was really fabulous and we were very joyful and thought that this is going to be a wonderful opportunity to achieve the first of many such places. So, and then she invited me back to, um, meet Thea and, um, it was from then on we were we saw each other regularly and, and were friends, close friends. And she was significantly older than you, right? Um, I guess, I guess she was about 16 years older. That's all, not that much. So tell me about um, sort of the kind of friends that you were and how it was that you came to live near her and well, um, well, I was visiting Edie and Theo frequently when um, they had a home out in the Hamptons, so I was a regular visitor out there and um, <clears throat> finally had the opportunity. To, well, I, my hobby was renovating houses and doing the work myself. <clears throat> you know, 4,000 brick patios and taking walls down and building new walls and all that. And I did that for th three houses and, you know, selling each house and then moving on to something a little bit better. And so that was my hobby. And, and after mm, probably two decades of doing that, I decided um, I was lonely. I didn't want to be spending my weekends on these projects, although I had my my coffee and my music, and I loved concrete results because my job was <clears throat> complex and dealing with what we all called the panel of experts, and it was nice to have my own projects and get my results and all that, but I had enough of that. And so anyway, long story short, um, I moved to New York in the 90s and um, and New York um, was all that it could be for me everything I I wanted and just a great place so I had the pleasure of of working here and living in New Jersey but then to actually have it all in one um, one geographic area was a plus made it easy mentioned that you were intentional in choosing an apartment that was close to Edie and Thea? Right. I actually had several um, gay friends in the area, and um, I thought this, you know, if I could um, get an apartment um, in the village, that would be great, be near them. And um, so it all worked out. And um, unfortunately, all my friends are no longer with us, um, who I moved here for, but, um, but new friends have come along. That's really hard, though. It's different. It's very different. Because I you know, have friends that um, after work, I just I take my dinner over and we'd have dinner together because you know they're 10 or 15 years older than I was. and. Um, they hadn't been out or couldn't get out or one thing or another and um, and it was nice and it was nice for me to to have that opportunity because um, I have been very lucky to meet some wonderful people who are very smart and have taught me so much um, and introduced me to all kinds of culture uh, which I might not have been able to find on my own. So 
it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. So tell me about the um, kinds of things that you and Edie and, and with and without Thea, like what kinds of things did you do? Well, let's see. Well, um, I can't say when I when I um, went out to visit Edie and Thea, we we did go out, but we weren't running around all the time. But we didn't need to, because um, one of the things was that was so special about Edie and Thea is that you felt when you were there with them, you felt like you were in the center of the world. You know, that it was a happening place. You were gonna have really great conversations. You were gonna learn something. Um, you were gonna have some laughs, some humor, some imagination. Um, and it was just, it was magic. It was really magic. And it was all, it was all happening right there in their house. And we would go out um, in the evening to a party or an ego event or one thing or another, but we didn't have to, to have a good time. And did you feel um, close to both of them? I did. I did. I was a little closer to Thea in that um, during a certain point, um, Thea couldn't write letters to Edie, so um, there would be an occasion, Edie's birthday or one thing or another, and um, where she wanted to have a note for Edie, and I would help her with that and, and write it out for her. So that was a great service that I could provide with nice handwriting and <laughs> the personal touch. It's also an intimate thing to do. Right. Right. Because Thea had MS, is that right? Yes. Yeah, which she'd had for a long time, even in the 80s, if I remember. Yeah, I, I think she had it for maybe a total of 35 years, something like that. But, you know, and we had, you know, with health events on both sides, Edie's and Thea's, um, that came along um, it was a very deep friendship um, through you know all those wonderful happy times and um, funny times as well as um, when a disaster would strike and you know stepping up and getting through it I mean it, frequently I thought of of us as a trio almost at certain times. So it was it was deep. I I don't think I've had that kind of a friendship with Thea or Edie with anybody else. I have a couple of, of girlfriends like that that I not I, there's nobody I'm closer to really. Yeah. 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 But it's a you know it's amazing how deep a friendship can go. You don't realize it until you have it. Yeah. Well, until you realize what other people don't share. Mm-hmm. Right. But also how the energy of, of people involved um, can kind of grow together. So tell me about their, um, their getting married. Well, that was a wonderful, crazy thing. And Edie had all kinds of obstacles, too, because she had been married once so long ago. And of course, it was before computers. So she had to have all kind of documentation about um, her being a single woman at this point. And, and then so much more. And they didn't want to just get married anywhere. Uh, they wanted to, they decided it would be best to go to Canada because since Canada 
uh, passed the acceptance of gay marriage. It was legal in Canada. Um, it would carry more weight than just a state. So that was the goal. So anyway, then it was a matter of, uh, and part of it too was there was um, Thea um, received notice from her doctors that she, her time was limited, her remaining time was limited. And so she had been kind of ambivalent on marriage and then she decided, you know, this is something that E wanted and now she wanted it too, very badly. So, um, so that's how it all started. And um, then it was, okay, we're going to Toronto. And then it was, how are we going to get Thea there? And there were no planes that, uh, there was not a plane where we could go up and come back on the same day, which made it a challenge. So anyway, we had a team. I th there were about eight of us, six or eight of us. Um, the one gay man, Matt, um, and then the rest of us. And Matt was there to do the heavy lifting. So he did a beautiful job and um, we got up there. And also Toronto has a monorail to, I think it's the Sheridan Hotel. So we didn't need to rent a special van to go. We could just hop on the monorail once we got off the plane and go right to the hotel. And um, so later that night, we had the wedding, which was amazing and moving and um, just filled with love. And it was just one of the highlights uh, that you can imagine. So tell me who, who um, officiated at the wedding? Um, Harry Brownlee, who was a, a judge in Canada, a gay judge. So he did, he did the ceremony. And obviously you've gotten in touch and he understood the import and he oh, came. Oh, absolutely. He came to yeah. the hotel? Yes, yes. And he's quite a character himself, I must say. And what year was this? Oh, let's see. Um, I think it was 2000 and six or seven. I know, I knew. I forgot, I got my photo. So, and do you remember, did everybody dress up? What did, oh, we did. Tell me, what did oh, everybody we had, wear? Uh, we dressed up and um, Aidy had arranged for white corsages for all of us and we had a wedding cake and the wedding and the uh, reception uh, took place in the same room. And um, Thea was all dressed up, looking beautiful. And um, as was Edie in a white silk pantsuit. She seems to be famous for that, both then and, and later on. Um, and it was just spectacular. And it was just your small group? There were a few others. Um, Harry Brownlee, um, He had some. He had his partner, and there were a few other people that came as well. And do you remember why Thea was initially reluctant to get married? I think she maybe thought it wasn't necessary, but I really couldn't tell you what her thoughts were on it. And do you know why it was important to Edie? She's that kind of girl. She's that kind of girl. And you know, the thing was afterwards, um, I mean, and for afterwards and forevermore after they got married, um, they felt their relationship was different, that it was deeper and um, they were treated differently and they had respect now. And every day they said it was different. 
What did you think of that? I could see that it was different for them. And they were very proud of it. And before that, had you been interested in the idea of gay marriage? Did that, was that something that you thought was important? Or? Well, I think, um, you know, I think with so many gay people having families, that marriage equality is important. For one thing, just a very realistic, down-to-earth legitimizing of our relationships. And I think, I think it should be. Some of the people I've interviewed said that they, they completely think that now, but when they remember themselves as younger, um, part of what they enjoyed, even though it was hard, was um, the strength of the community being outside of the mainstream. And so they're a little bit surprised at now finding it so important, but also maybe feeling like something has been uh, forfeited, is maybe, do you, does that resonate for you? Well, it does. Well, I think it was a different lifestyle, and it was, our lives were lived in a different way because um, we weren't legitimized, and so, it did affect our relationships. And I think our relationships have become more serious um, and we've assimilated. And a lot of people f are ambivalent about the fact that we are assimilated, um, the, that we are um, maybe tolerated but not accepted. And um, there, someone um, wrote a book called The Tolerance Trap, which talks about that. Tolerance is one thing, but that doesn't mean you're actually accepted. And I have the feeling that acceptance comes a lot more easily to those who have children and families, I think. The, you know, at this point, and when you worry about what the future is, um, I don't think you could take that away from people who are married and have children. It just won't work. So, I mean, that's another reason to be so grateful that Edie and Thea came along at this time and got as much accomplished as they did before we are where we are today. So you must have been involved when the DOMA decision happened. Can you tell me about that? Oh, <laughs> gee, being Edie's good friend and all the things that we did and places we went um, and hearing people's stories from our community, um, it was just a life-altering and delightful experience where um, just I just have such profound love for our community because the stories that um, came to Edie's attention while I'm standing there, you know, were just so astounding about what it um, what it did for everybody, and I was I went with Edie. Um, down to Washington um, while they were practicing for their uh, Supreme Court hearing. And uh, of course, Edie was already famous, um, knowing that the case, you know, was coming up in the next couple of weeks and all the um, district um, hearings that she won. Um, but for instance, we were in um, we were in the National Museum and going in the underground um, over to another section of it, and um, this woman was trying to take a selfie with her child in front of the waterfall that's downstairs, and um, Edie and I are sitting at a table and Edie's having some gelato, and so I just jumped up to go help the lady um, take the picture. Um, and so I, I go over to the woman and, and um, say, well, can I help you take the picture? 
And she said, oh, yes, thank you. Is that Edie Windsor over there? And I said, yes, it is. Would you like to meet her? <laughs> and the woman, the mother was just, she was thrilled. And so I turn around to walk back to the table. And in the meantime, she has um, gotten her partner to come over with the other two kids. So now the... Uh, the four of them, actually it was three kids. So um, the two mothers and the three kids are coming over and um, the, the original mother turns to her three kids and says, this is the lady that's going to make us a real family. And it was just so moving. It really was. And it was a biracial couple filled with love. And those kids didn't quite understand because they were too young, but we did. So Edie and I, so they talked to Edie for a while and then they continued on their way. And then Edie had finished her gelato and we went on the people mover across the um, the bottom of the, um, the building and just so we're so we're both teared up from this experience, and then somebody that's going the other way on the people mover says, "Edie, Edie Windsor," and then then they come, you know, they have to go all the way down and then come back. And anyway, so we don't even get a chance to recover from one experience. Then there's another, and there's so many stories out that uh, like that, and even so many. Edie and I were regular walkers to the river and like we would be walking along minding our own business and we'd hear a taxi jam jam on its brakes and right on the corner and the electric window rolls down and the female taxi driver leans over and says thank you thank you so much i'm getting married next thursday because of you and you know that was another one and another person up in provincetown said, you know, I would be homeless if you hadn't done this because now my partner was run over and killed and now I, I'm going to be getting her social security because we were married and um, I was able to get a mortgage from the bank so that I will have a place to live. And you know, another one was this um, deaf mute sent Edie a video. Thanking Edie. And so she did sign language and then underneath were the, um, the caption of what she was um, signing. And it was so moving. And she closed with the line, you know, I hope that I can meet someone like Thea someday too. But there have been so many moving stories. It's unbelievable, you know, what has happened because of Edie and Thea. And I have had the great joy of being there and hearing so many of these stories, even even something like um, Edie and I were in Provincetown one time and um, we walked in after dinner. It was probably around ten thirty at night. We walked into the um, to the uh, hotel and it had a bar inside its little courtyard area, and I think about forty gay men. Gave, stood up and gave her a standing ovation. And <laughs> it was just, just like, oh, our community, it's just love, 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 love. And it's just great. And, and it sounds like she wore her fame really gracefully. Oh, absolutely. Nobody was, was better to have had that opportunity, gotten it done and articulated so much about what it means to so many and how we deserve it. As 
sounds like she was also joyful and oh it was all love it was one big love fest <laughs> and then celebrity for Edie it was like it was just so amazing to it, you know you're on the subway and people just say thank you and I, it was just it was a yes it was celebrity but it was a celebrity like no other um, because people didn't really want something necessarily like an autograph or whatever they wanted just to thank her because she had done so much for them and she literally put you know thousands of dollars in some many people's pockets you know not having to pay capital gains when your spouse dies on the apartment that you've lived in all those years or the house um, just so much and she always made us proud she always had the right thing to say and she worked hard at saying it she did her homework for every time she was speaking anywhere it didn't just necessarily flow out although I'm sure it could have but she tried to make it as as articulate and um, meaningful as she could by doing her homework first That's awesome. so can you tell me about um, when Thea died what, what was that time well I remember I remember eating me, Edie calling me in the office and um, saying that Thea had passed away. And, um, you know, if I wanted to come by and say goodbye, now's the time. So fortunately, well, for, fortunately, I got her phone call, and fortunately, I was able to leave the office to go up and, and say my goodbye. And um, <clears throat> and Thea um, wanted to have a service at the center over on 13th Street, and uh, so there was a memorial service quite a maybe a month or two or three later. In the meantime, I guess what I remember most was spending the night in the hospital at St. Vincent's. Um, with Edie while she was having multiple heart attacks. Um, and even while she was laying there, she thought the head nurse in the emergency room was cute. And <laughs> it was one way, you're kidding about that, constantly every time she came over, it was one way to get through the night. Um, so anyway, but that was the broken heart syndrome, heart attack that people sometimes get. And she had heart attacks almost right after Thea died, is that right? Right, and right. And she hadn't had that before? Oh no, she had quite a few. She, yeah. had, she had heart uh, problems. But, um, but then, you know, um, the movie that came out about uh, Edie and Thea's life was a, really truly a saving grace and that was um, the time when Edie was grieving the loss of Thea and yet at the same time basically um, I think Thea died in February and uh, the movie came out in June in San Francisco and 20 or 30 of us all went out to San Francisco for the premiere on Castro Street. And this um, showing of the movie around the country and around the world was a wonderful way for um, Edie. She had to step up to do the... Um, you know, the talk after the movie, and receiving all the love from so many people uh, about the movie and their relationship and um, everything that they were. Just getting all that love helped her get through, you know, it, and it was years, and 
anyway, you, it kept Edie alive, and it was a unique way of grieving, but so important because it was so big that um, I'm not sure Edie would have survived without the movie, quite honestly. I've seen it. That's the long engagement. Right, right. Well, and it's such a tribute to their love and mm -hmm. the power of what they accomplished that I could see that that would help hold her up. Right, and they were just the, um, the two of them making the most of life and it being rich and beautiful despite some limitations. It, it's really an in, inspiration for living a life that we could all take a lesson from. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's just over a year since Edie passed. Right. Can you tell me about, about what it's been like for you to not to have her anymore? Well, I've missed her incredibly because um, she was definitely a part of my life. And uh, I feel like uh, quite a, a big element of my life is missing. Mm -hmm. But I'm grateful for having her and having Thea. Just grateful. Did you know that she, that her life was coming to an end? Well, she, she just, um, suddenly things were falling apart. And um, she did, she was aware that things were falling apart. And um, so she had time to, um, she had a period of time to um, do what she needed to do. That's so heavy though, huh? And Barack Obama called her when she was in the hospital to send his love and caring from Michelle and himself what did that mean to her? It meant everything. <laughs> it meant everything. And it was just, it was, of course it was special, but it was, um, it was deep. So, um, I, I don't have anything else specific that I wanted to ask you about. Uh, but I, if there's anything you want to share, or tell me about um, Tasty. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground. I, um, I'm concerned for the future. Um, so we'll see. <laughs>